Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this video. And today we're going to talk about a case study that was given to someone who went up for an interview for a business analyst job. And this was the case study that they were given. Now I've done a number of videos on different case studies and you can check out some of these videos here. I have this one. I'll put the link for you to go click on that one. I also have uh, this one right here. That's actually in two parts. I have a part one and a part two for this one. And it's really very interesting. So I'm very encouraged with the way that, um, you know, people have been addressing their case studies. I've gotten so many people who book consultations with me and say, hey, Carolise, you know, thank you. Your, your videos have helped me. And now I've gotten to the final stage of my interview. And now they're giving me a case study, right? <laughs> Where I help them to think through it. Because in my consults, I don't do the work for you, right? I equip you to be able to do the work yourself. That way, when you go in the interview, you know what you're talking about. And when you get the job, you know how to do it. It wouldn't make any sense for me to go do the work for you and hand it over. It doesn't make sense. I have to help you to think in the right way so that no matter what you get, when you get your job, you have the right thinking, the right strategy, the right approach to be successful. So here's an example of a case study that was given for an actual job interview. And here's what they wanted. So they're asking about workshops. So here's a, here's a, the, the problem that was given as a case study. So present your approach for organizing a requirements gathering workshop, touching on the following questions. How would you go about defining a problem statement? What should be your approach to confirm goals and desired outcomes with your business stakeholders across cross functional areas? How will you ensure that the new technology will address the goals and outcomes and what metrics should we establish to track success? Okay, so this was a question that was given. So how do you approach this, <laughs> right? Where do you start? Especially if you're a new BA, you've never done a workshop, you're like, what in the world are they even asking me, right? But I'll tell you guys. So let's get into this. So this is the case study that was given for someone going up for an interview. And how do you approach this? So let's start off by what should you be doing in any interview that you get for a BA job? Let's start with the beginning. So you do this presentation, you're getting into the room, you know you'll be presenting to a panel of people. The first thing you do is not jump into the details of the actual question, but remember you're still in an interview, right? You have to promote yourself, you have to, um, make yourself memorable. You have to market yourself. You are selling yourself as a solution to their problem and you're trying to get the job. So don't overlook that because you're too eager to get to the answers that you came up with for the case study. So the first slide would be about yourself, right? You make a slide about yourself. You talk about where you're located because sometimes we're doing this virtually and just to remind everybody where you're located because the people in the room, maybe one person gave you the case study, but everybody else there may not be aware of exactly what you're about to present. They may not have inter interviewed you before, or maybe they have, but this is a chance for you to really imprint your brand on them. Don't spend too long on this, but don't omit it either. It's very important. So you put a picture of yourself, a nice professional picture, and you talk about yourself, your years of experience, industries you've worked in, professional things, right? Don't spend too long, but give them a nice, little background into you. And then you create another slide that um, really goes into extra activities that you do. Maybe you like to go for a run. Maybe you like to swim. Maybe you like to hike. Maybe you travel to some exotic places. Maybe you like to fish. Maybe you, whatever. But something that adds personality. Like what do you do outside of work? So they can start to see you as a whole 360 degree person, right? You're not just an employee potentially, but you are a whole person. You have a child, you have pets, you have a life, you you spend time on the sea or whatever, whatever you do in your spare time, put a slide in there that has some examples of those things. So you can make yourself more memorable. You want to present yourself as a complete person. And then you jump into 
say the problem. So always have a slide that reiterates details of the exact problem that they gave you before you jump into the details. So now they're asking about how would you approach organizing a requirements gathering workshop? I need to be able to answer these four bullet pointed questions that they have. So here, here we go. Let's go. Ready? Let's do it. Okay. So the first thing I would do if I were to be the one presenting this is I would start talking about why I use a workshop, like what a workshop is and why I use it. So again, you don't want your slide to really be word for word, whatever you're going to say, but the slide should be like a reference point and you really are the presenter. They can look at the slide to just follow along, but it shouldn't represent everything you're going to say. So you talk about what a workshop is. Then you talk about why why you'd use a workshop. Of course, we all know what a workshop is, I assume, which is it's a way to pull multiple people together to elicit requirements, um, to find out things, to get some involvement. It's a group set setting for sure. So the reason why I would use a workshop as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one interview would be for, you know, there's a short time to gather requirements. I need to get these requirements and I don't have the time to go through and schedule individual stakeholder interviews because of the short time that we have to get this information together. Maybe there's a large number of subject matter experts and it would not be practical to try to interview all of them, although you could pick a few and just do those, but you'd really miss out on some details that other people may have to, to offer. Groups can provide a larger number of requirements faster for sure. If you have a big group of people, you can they all look at the same problem or they all can tell you different parts of the problem. You can just gather requirements much faster in a one sitting than you would if you were to try to do this individually. Workshops help validate the requirements on the spot. So as one person says, you know, this is what we do in this department or whatever, somebody else can validate, say, yes, that's true. And when it gets to us, we do this. And so you can have that back and forth. And it's clearer than if you were to talk to one person, get what they say, talk to somebody else, they may contradict that person. Then I got to go back to another session and there's back and forth that takes time. But in the one sitting, if you have all the right people in the room, you can get that validation right away. The other benefit of using the workshop is having multiple people looking at a process can inspire discussion that is difficult to have in individual interviews. So I find that when you have a workshop, you end up having ideas spark faster because there people in the room are all focused on this one problem and ideas start to flow. It's like whenever the human mind focuses on something completely and there are multiple people focusing on the same thing, it's like, it's like atoms, right? that change because you're looking at it. Um, I find that when you're when you're trying to solve a problem and you have the right people in the room, the right attitude, the right focus, uh, ideas just fly and start solving it much better. It fosters collaboration and idea generation. I gotta fix that little typo right there. So it fosters a collaboration and generation for sure. So these are the reasons why you would use the workshop. Now, again, you, the question that they ask you is what you know, present your approach for organizing requirement gathering workshops and touching on how would you go about defining a problem statement, what should be your approach to confirm goals and desired outcomes, how will you ensure that the new technology will address the goals and outcomes, what metrics would you use. But you can't just jump into bullet point number one, like define the problem statement. You have to first, you know, give some flesh to what a workshop is and why you're even using it, right? Again, they didn't give a time for this, but you'd assume that you may have, let's say, half an hour or 20 minutes to discuss 10 minutes for questions and answers. So you kind of try to time yourself so you don't spend too much time on one topic. Um, and if you'd like, if this is something you feel like you don't want to explain point by point, you could give an overall general summary of what, you know, what a workshop is and why you use it. And then if they have any questions, you can refer back to the slide and get into more detail later on. The next thing you should talk about is Things to consider in the workshop. So the first thing you think about when you're trying to plan a workshop is the number of participants, right? Who to include, right? Make sure you do a good stakeholder analysis. So you can figure out who are the stakeholders and who should make sense to invite to this workshop session. Identify the vision. What is the end result that you hope to achieve at the end of this workshop? What activities can you do to engage the members when you have a group of people sitting in a room it, it can become 
it can become hard to manage if you're not careful because you could have one person with the loudest voice that one you know dominating the whole conversation or you could have lethargy people get bored or you know if you don't get the conversation started right people can start arguing so make sure you have idea generating activities planned for them icebreaker activities activities that will help think through the problem in a creative way it takes a little bit more creativity to manage a workshop because it's not like an interview where you just get that person's undivided attention when you're in a big group you know you could have side conversations all these different things so you have to be very creative to make sure you keep everybody focused on the goal that you have and you can't have a goal unless you have you really thought about the vision of the workshop and what you're trying to accomplish. Make sure you have your materials. If you need a whiteboard, a flip chart, the sticky notes. Sometimes you need bigger sticky notes because they can't read. Like if the room is very big, they can't really read from like if they're sitting too far away from the from the front. Um, but now that we have online activities, Miro board is pretty good for on you know workshop style whiteboarding. So you could create a virtual whiteboard and then you could zoom in to be able to see everybody have access they can jump in together you know we could do a fair, fairly good number of online activities that you wouldn't really miss in person necessarily but you can't really beat having everybody physically in a room but you can really find virtual tools to help mural also i've used mural and if you really want to go super super cheap <laughs> but still useful you can do google jamboard as these online virtual tools so that's what you need to consider when you're planning a workshop um what do you avoid in the workshop well not a lot you just want to make sure you facilitate the meeting well that you get people's participation you call any side conversations you make sure that not only one person's opinion is everything that you're hearing that you try to get participation from everybody else without making that person feel like they can't speak. You know, sometimes it goes the opposite way where one person is like taking over the whole thing. And then you might say, okay, let me hear from somebody else. And that person starts to feel like, oh, you don't want to hear my opinion and they shut up and then no, nobody speaks. So <laughs> you want everybody to feel included and you have to be very, very creative and uh, skilled at getting everybody to be able to feel comfortable enough to speak up. All right. Discussion dominated by one person is not good right feeling of being judged right it needs to be an uh it's a, it needs to be a judgment free zone no judgment right they should feel like they can say whatever crazy idea it might sound stupid to them it might be silly it might be uh completely unattainable ridiculous ideation sessions need to be you need to be allowed to say the ridiculous out loud and it's okay right and how do you set that atmosphere so you need to make sure you create that in the beginning you say that these there's no bad idea right everything is everything can be said and changed and it's just an open area for all kinds of discussions around this topic all right so you talk about that and then you set the expectation. We talk about not having any bad ideas and about everybody participating. So that's kind of the things that you do. Now, when you open the workshop, you want to clarify again as a facilitator, you're facilitating this, the session. You need to clarify why they're there. Goes back to your vision and your goal for the workshop, right? And then you, you know, you share the vision. You explain the value of the exercise that you're going to do. And if you have multiple exercises, you say, okay, before each exercise, you explain what, why they're doing it. So nobody feels like, what am I doing this for? <laughs> right? You make sure they know upfront, okay, we're going to do this exercise. So the aim of it will be to do that. And then we, at the end, we'll have this. And then people kind of know where they're going. They'll be willing to follow you down the rabbit hole. If they know at the end, this is what you're trying to accomplish. You have your ice bit breakers and these are some examples i have two truths and a lie some quiz jeopardy style questions you know all kinds of stuff there are so many ways to to do icebreakers there's some links i can share with you below about icebreakers there's a lot of ways to do that and you need to be the leader in the discussion even though it's not only your opinion but they need to see that there's somebody really like navigating them through this process and that person needs to be you the ba so if you're in a physical room get up get to the to the whiteboard be the one to write on the whiteboard be kind of like in charge right and if it's a virtual then you're the one opening up mirror board you're the one typing it in you're the one making sure everybody's following along 
you know, so be 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 a leader in this session. You can't have everybody leading, otherwise it's chaos. They have to see you as the person in charge of the session. You decide when it's break time. You decide when um, you you write on the board. You ask the questions and you take the feedback. Like just be seen as a person in charge in the situation.